lockdown um, does strange things to one. And last year when we went into the heavy lockdown, I got all sorts of um, interesting things to do. And I started looking at various bits of research that interested me. And so I, I don't do academic research. I do um, research for pleasure and for knowledge and things that I'd like to pursue and that I'm interested in. And um, I also want to say on the outset that I'm no expert on any of these topics. Um, I've garnered much knowledge from work done previously by other people. But what I do like to do um, is look at the past as a living thing. I look at people as having lived and I'm interested in what people did, um, not so much just as a name and a date. So um, I hope you'll enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you can always go and make a cup of tea or go and water the garden quickly. That's one of the nice things with Zoom. Um, we don't see who's not paying attention and it doesn't really matter either. So I worked with Dan Slay and many of you know him. I worked with him for a number of years together at the Center for Conservation Education. And he taught me many things. And one of the things he said to me is the archives are full of stories. He didn't say full of documents or books or official um, letters. He said stories, which means the stories of people. And I've always um, taken that to heart. So I have to also give credit then to, to two particular sources that I have found most useful. The first 50 years, a project by Delia Robertson, and I'm sure many of you know it. And then the occasional series by Mansell Upham, um, Uprooted Lives, and um, a tremendous amount of research that has gone into practically every single person who lived at the Cape in those first 50 years. Um, and you can find out everything you want to know about any of those people um, from those sources. So um, what did Maria Evertz look like? Well, of course, we don't know. But this picture is often put up on various sites, the Commissa sites and so on, um, as a possibility of what she looked like. I don't really think it is good likeness of her, but doesn't matter. Um, it does give us some idea, namely that she was not white. Um, she had a dark, lustrous complexion, and for that she was very often called Suarte Maria. Um, she was tall and, and, and carried herself very well, and so people who met her always remembered her. Um, for instance, the Reverend Samuel Briarcliff, who came to the Cape in 1713, had this to say about her. Um, and in particular, he stressed that she is a tall woman, very black having sparkling eyes. So we know something about her. We can say that we acknowledge that she was very tall. And for that, of course, she would have probably have stood out quite a bit. He talks about her being a black moll. And moll, of course, is short for Molly or Mary or Maria, which is a play on her name. But it is also sometimes a term used to describe a loose woman and whether or not that um, fits Maria, that we don't know, but it's up to conjecture. So let's start with what we do know about her. For instance, her father was Evert van Guinea. Um, so he was born around about 1640 um, in the country that's now known as Benin. And he arrived in 1658, around about at the age of 18 on the Hustled. Um, a ship which carried about 200 enslaved people. Jan van Riebeek himself had this to say about the Guinean people. They are very good looking, strong and cheerful people. And I don't want to um, belittle what slavery is, but I think it just reflects a little bit on the characters of these people who arrived from Guinea. Um, Evert was sold to Kasper Brinkmann and within a few months to Jan van Riebeek as a personal slave. The following year we see him being manumitted, in other words he was given his freedom. And the reason he was given his freedom is because he collaborated 
when some of the other slaves had absconded, he knew where their hiding place was and he revealed that to Jan van Riebeek and that was his reward to be manumitted. And some years later, um, after van Riebeek had left the Cape already, one of the other governors, he was granted a plot of land, uh, one hectare in size, which I believe, and mass is not my strong point, around about the size of two rugby fields. Now that's not bad for a garden. I love my garden. My garden is one fraction of that size. Um, I don't know that I could even manage a garden the size of two rugby fields. But in those days, gardens were not there for pleasure. They were there to grow food and to provide food security. He must have built a very rudimentary house initially. And um, we know that in 1674, he had built a new house because when he took a loan from the um, orphan chamber, he put up his house as collateral. Do we know where that market garden was, that land that he was given? Yes, we do. It was plot number G51, which you can see there in the circle. And it's roughly where Ruland Street is now. And you can see the stream there that was the Farsa River, and he was allowed to use that water free for nothing to water his garden. So that was a, the, a good start. And from here, he could build himself up um, into, into a, free, a free person. Um, just roughly, if one had to overlay that area today, which was actually done in 1968, you can see roughly it's between Barrick Street and Roland Street, where that market garden was. It was, of course, over the next 100 years or 200 years, very quickly gobbled up by development. I've put this drawing in by Frederick Knivet um, just to show you what the area looked like. In the foreground, you can see the land that eventually became District 6. And in the background or in the middle, you can more or less still see some walled uh, market gardens. Um, Evert of Guinea's garden would by then probably already have been swallowed up, so it would be a little bit further back um, behind those gardens, but just gives one a, a good idea, and, and I rather like this picture. I also like that the um, artist put himself in there like a selfie. Um, Maria Evert's mother was Anna, also known as Huna, which was probably closer to her real name, um, also came from Guinea, this came on the same ship, but she was much younger. She was only 11 when she came. I don't know into whose ownership she went straight, straight away, but in 1659, she had a child. She was only 12 at the time. She had a child by one of the other slaves who'd been on the ship with her. And at that point, then Jan van Riebeek bought her um, as a wet nurse for his youngest daughter, Elizabeth, who was born that year, and also to be a nanny to Lambert and Abraham and Anthony, his, his three sons at the time. What is sad about this is that her own child was taken away from her at that point and given to other people. And I don't know if we even know anything about what happened to the child, but because she, um, she was lactating, she was used as a wet nurse. An interesting thing happened in 1710 when Maria van Hoorn, who was Jan van Riebeek's granddaughter, she was the daughter of Abraham um, van Riebeek. She called at the Cape with the return fleet and um, somehow she and Maria Evertz met up. I don't know who looked up who, that would be quite interesting to know, but they had a discussion. And Maria van Hoorn later wrote in letters that she met up with Maria Everts, who was the daughter of a slave who had been in her family's household and had looked after her father, Abraham. And at that point, Maria Everts, or Swarte Maria, gave her a little packet of seeds, um, probably from her own garden, 
and said she should take them and send them to Batavia, to the family that was there. I, I find that quite an interesting connection that somehow there was some degree of affection between Anna and her owners and the work that she did for the Van Riebeek household, which she must have imparted to her daughter, Maria, um, and the, 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 the affection almost that Swata Maria had in passing along, along a small little packet of seeds, life itself in a way. Um, when Jan van Riebeek and his family left the Cape, um, Anna was sold to Hendrik Boer. And he was, um, of course, as many of you know, the head gardener. And then she and Evert started a de facto uh, relationship. And in 1663, Maria Evert was born. Her mother was 16 years old at the time. Um, do we know where she was born? Well, maybe, but it's conjecture. Um, Hendrik Boom, who owned Maria's mother at the time, lived in a brick house or stone house outside the fort. And so it's very likely that that's where Maria Everts first saw the light of day. Later, um, they were both sold to the baker, Matthias Kuiman. Um, Maria was two years old at the time. And by 1671, Evert was in a position to purchase both of their freedoms. Um, that again is very touching, you know, that a man has to buy his wife and his daughter to give them their freedom, that they can come and live with him in freedom. Um, yeah, and that is then when he built the new house on their market garden. This is not a picture of the house. Um, it's actually the garden, but I, I quite like the picture because it shows a typical house of that time, or so I like to think. So I'm sure that Everett's house was very similar and it was quite possibly added on over the years, like this one obviously has been. Um, there were a fair number of people that eventually lived in that household. Now that market garden um, was obviously not Maria's to begin off with, um, but she watched Evert, she watched her father and she learned to farm and she probably worked there with him. She was a curious and intelligent child and learned very quickly and her father trusted her to sell the produce. So she sold the fruit and vegetables that he grew and probably seeds as well um, on the market. And she also through that learned how to make business deals. And she was, she had a very good aptitude for that. In her teen years, she had relationships with three men, um, all three of whom um, gave her children um, and We'll come across a few of them, or at least one of them, as we progress through this. Um, the household of the Everts family was quite tempestuous. They were a lively bunch of people, and they developed a reputation for clashes. Um, and because they were in the middle of town, so close to the fort, of course, anything that created a stir got noticed quite quickly. All of the women in the household were constantly in trouble with the law. Um, so whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, at least they were lively, interesting um, and opinionated people, I should say as well. Um, in 1679, she was sentenced to six months hard labor for harboring an absconded slave. Now that's probably quite a harsh sentence considering first of all, that she was only 16 year old, 16 years old, also that she was pregnant with a love child by Willem ten Dummer, who was the Dutch East India Company's chief surgeon. It, it also shows us that she had a conscience in that she harbored the slave, possibly somebody, well, very likely somebody that she knew, given that there were so few people at the Cape and they all knew each other. Um, she was a bit of an activist, I suppose we would say in, in, in modern terminology. That same year, 
what an adventurous time she had in that particular year. She married a fellow freed slave, Jackie Joy. They were 16 and 32 respectively, um, big age difference. They married in the um, Dutch East India Com uh, Dutch Reformed Church, which was quite unusual at that time. But as, hmm, no, my cursor isn't working. Okay, how do I do that now? Okay, right, so the marriage only lasted about eight months because um, Jackie claimed that she tried to poison him. And they actually had a legal separation, um, so serious it seemed to be. Um, and then there was another brawl that got them all in front of the court. Um, and at that time, the um, person who heard, I don't know if he was a judge or, you know, whatever, but he was not surprised there was this brawl and he uttered this statement, the wicked and dishonest household of Anna of Guinea and Maria Evertz. So they did definitely have a bit of a reputation. I found it quite interesting, this thing about, did she really try to poison her husband? Um, we know from a, a letter that was written that she grew these particular vegetables. Now that's not all that she grew. Obviously, I think there were vines and various other things, but these are some of the more common ones. And saladines, that pricked my interest because I had no idea what saladines were. And it's actually the saladine plant, which is quite useful as an anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic, a diuretic, a laxative, you name it, it's got a whole lot of particularly digestive curative properties. And um, so I can imagine that the husband was complaining of various ailments and she offered to cook him up something to cure him. And um, well, the saladine plant is actually mildly poisonous. So maybe she overdid it. Maybe she did it deliberately because apparently he had just been caught having an extramarital affair. I think it was probably more accidental, but you never know. And then enters one Bastian Jans Colain. He was from Schravenzande in the Netherlands and he came in about 1680. Um, he came as a soldier and round about 1685, Bastian and Maria entered into a relationship. Um, after her father died, obviously her mother inherited the property and eventually it came to her and Maria and Bastian were living in the lean-to on the property and he worked in the garden. That leads me to believe he might have been her knecht um, because apparently, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, um, that the soldiers with the Dutch East India Company who had specific skills like gardening could, even though they were in the employ of the company as soldiers, could go and work as knechts in these market gardens. Um, so I think it is possible that, that that's how they met, that he came to work in the garden and that he had some experience of gardening and possibly even wine growing. Um, he became a free burger and then in 1692, their eldest child, they had four altogether, but the eldest Johannes Colain was born. And I've marked him in red because he's an important part of the story. Now, Maria made a good living, so it seems, from her garden. Although I sometimes wonder how one can make a living selling vegetables because I don't think too many people have been overly successful at that, certainly not become rich but she was clever with her money. And she then began investing in, la investing in land. Um, she bought Klaver Falle, which is now Klaver Falle near Darling. That's the farm near Grote Post, and it's a very important farm. I have not as yet managed to pursue 
when that was and who she bought it from or whether she got it from the company um, and who she sold it to. I don't know any of those details. That's still uh, to be looked at. She also had the Morsel Bank Rufi near Durbanville. She had grazing and hunting rights. And she put her eldest son, Jokobus Ten Dama, the child that she was pregnant with when she had to do hard labor, um, at the Morsel Bank. Um, he was a lot older than Johannes Kulain by about 13 years or so. And then enter Willem Adrian van der Stel. Now, most of you have heard about him, you know about him. All of us think about him as the bad boy of the governors of the Cape, but he, he did do some good. Now, he was very interested in agriculture and he did lots of experiments and he was very keen on increasing the food production at the Cape. And that was necessary because the, the, the settlement was growing, the colony was growing and food security was number one in his mind. Um, now Maria, being clever and astute, saw her opportunity with this. And so in 1701, she asked him for some land. And the land she asked for was, after the Clove in Tafelfallet, now the Zeestrand too. It had no other name other than that, just a geographical location. I think there's somebody waiting in, waiting in the waiting room, maybe. Um, I've let him in, thank you. Okay. Um, so he agreed to that verbally almost immediately because she sold the idea to him as there is land that hasn't been cultivated. If you let me farm it, I will grow vegetables for the market. So it was a no brainer. And in 1707, he signed over 60 Morgan to her. Um, I'm told, or I use these very smart calculators on the internet, <laughs> that it was 51,4 hectares. And um, that's quite a large size of land. He signed it over to her, um, but she only received the, the title deeds in 1713. Um, some of you may know that the, the selling of land and um, receiving title deeds was a very complicated process and you didn't get your title deeds the minute you bought the land. Sometimes it took forever and sometimes apparently the title deeds never even arrived. She did get them eventually though. But she probably set up farming much earlier. She didn't wait for the title deeds because she could have been dead by then. Um, so probably the minute he agreed, um, she went and set up that farm. This is the um, surveyor's drawing, Slotsbu, of that farm. The little stream there is the blink water stream, which some of you may know, and that is the land. And you can see that's very clearly Camps Bay. Um, so everything in red, more or less, um, is what was included in that 60 Morgan, um, obviously not beyond that because you probably also all know that camp space slopes terribly and it's very steep and you can't farm further up than that. Uh, the Blinkwater stream and this is the area where she farmed. So in other words, where it was flat um, and very close to the sea. Nobody wanted to live there in those days. It was practically inaccessible, um, but there were people who were using it and those were the Khoi people um, and possibly the Strandloopers, um, Garang High Corner, I think they were. Um, but, but here you can just see on a much older map, but you can see the layout of the farm. You can see Camps Bay and you can see very neat little um, plots of land where people farm. So this is 1782. That's quite a long way from the time that Maria Everts got the land. So it was farmed for a very long time. And the little blink water stream is still there. It's mostly underground. Or if you walk, if you follow it up Camps Bay, you can walk all through the up steps from um, street to street and you can actually see it tumbling through. It's mostly canalized but it's quite fascinating, it's still there. So 
let's talk a little bit about the koi who who may have been there at the time. Um, this is this is not at Camps Bay. This is further up on the west coast. Um, but these are what what were originally called strunk loopers by the colonists. In other words, people who made a living from shellfish and um, catching fish um, at, at the beach. That's how they lived. Um, and now they, they would definitely have been um, koi people there in Camps Bay because already in 1657, Jan van Riebeek had given them permission to build their huts on the neck. And Peter Colby, who came to the Cape um, to study, amongst other things, the stars and the Khoi people, he made notes that he saw the Khoi building their huts on the back of Lion's Head over the Kloof. So they were definitely there. There's no record, record of how they all did or did not get along. Um, Maria being an astute woman, she probably would not have interfered much with the Khoi people. And um, if there were no clashes, it means that quite possibly they, um, you know, kept their distance from each other and respected each other's space. Um, this is an interesting thing that, that happened in May 1730 in the Reverend Briercliffe or Briarcliff, I'm not quite sure how you, Briarcliff probably, um, he came to the Cape, they stopped over at the Cape on their way to the east, and he and his ship's captain were entertained at the castle by the then acting governor, who was Willem Hielot. Um, and there he was introduced to Maria, um, and he wrote this about her. And there you can see he talks about the vegetables and it's probably likely then that she cooked those vegetables as part of that meal. Um, and that's really interesting to me. Um, you know, why would the governor have Maria Evitz come and cook? Um, well, obviously she was good at it. She was good. She was charming. Um, Bria Cliff talks about her being a good host. Um, and so she was um, enchanting in some way, I suppose. Um, he also mentioned a pestilence, and I want to remind you about that just now. So I, I undertook a visit to the castle recently, and I was taken on a, on a very interesting personal tour. And they are using the um, rooms and apartments used by the governor um, again, and this is the governor's office and where he entertained guests. And um, so there you can see a little door there, and that door leads down to the kitchen. So on the left, you can see the steps starting, and then on the right, um, the steps going down, and precious little feet going down those steps. And underneath is a vast kitchen or was a vast kitchen. There's not much left of it, but it's really interesting. It's got multiple layers of history, um, different building styles and different times. Uh, the top picture shows obviously a very large um, cooking place, a hearth that was bricked up later, but I can imagine the fires were there, the cooking pots hung there, there might have even been a baking oven there as well. Um, and in the foreground, um, which is also the bottom picture, is a spring of fresh water. And that water, you can see that is a reflection there. That water is still there. And it's coming from an underground stream. It is not piped in. It's not modern municipal water. It is still the same water um, that the castle was built on to provide it with a never-ending flow of water. And then on the right, just um, a furrow also to take away the dirty water, to take it out of the kitchen. It's actually quite clever. So let's talk about that pestilence that Samuel Briarcliffe talked about. So you can see that he, he, he writes to um, whoever he was writing to back in England of his visit at the Cape. He talks about a pestilence. He doesn't mention it by name. 
either he didn't know it at the time or maybe he didn't want to alarm anybody. I, don't, I think he just didn't know. Um, he was only here probably for a few hours at the Cape. Um, but he notices that people are dropping like flies. And it was, of course, smallpox. Um, and what happened that was that in February of 1713, a Dutch ship called and there were already sailors on board who were sick of smallpox and their washing was brought ashore to the slave lodge to be washed. And in no time, the slaves got the disease and um, just look at how it was spread. I think you'll see quite a similarity between the pandemic that we're going through um, with, with the smallpox epidemic of 1713. So you can see how it was spread, face-to-face -face contact through clothing and bedding. It had a, 14, a 10 to 14 day incubation period before the first symptoms started showing. Um, and look at the symptoms. I mean, does it almost not describe COVID? And then the different um, symptoms or the, the effects of smallpox, spots that became blisters, um, filled with fluid and pus. And death, certainly here in this particular year, it's not, not everybody who gets smallpox dies, but a great many people did, um, some kind of systemic shock, shock to the immune system. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a medical doctor, um, but I'm sure somebody knows more about it than I do. And it swept Maria Evitz with it. Um, in June 1713, so just a few weeks after she had been in the governor's um, apartments, she had been cooking for uh, Briarcliffe uh, or Briarcliffe. Um, just a few short weeks later, she had it. She, she contracted it. Um, she hastily drew up her will. Um, and when the wool was drawn up, somebody came to her house and drew it up for her. She probably dictated to it. She was then already sick and bedridden. She named all her six children as her heirs. And Jacobus ten Damme, her oldest child, uh, he was given the Mosselbank. Johannes and Evert, the two sons by um, Bastian Colain, Klaver Vallee. Johanna Colain, who is her eldest, uh, no, not her eldest daughter, but her eldest daughter by uh, Bastian Colain, after the Kloof, in other words, the Camps Bay Farm. And on the 27th of June, Jakobus Tendama drew up his will because he also contracted smallpox. Um, and he left his share of his mother's will to his siblings, particularly to his half brother, Johannes Colain. So Maria died somewhere between the 8th and the 27th of June in 1713, and Jakobus ten Damme about two weeks later. So who went where from the children? So let's start with Johannes Colain. He was 21 at the time that his mother passed away. Um, he got Clara Fallet. He also got left um, half of um, the Mosel Bank by his brother. He also got his brother's 300 sheep and a few other things. It's quite possible that he sold the Mosel Bank at that stage, but I'm just speaking like as with a thumb suck, I have no evidence of that. Um, it may turn out completely different and that'll be exciting. So that's fine. At some point, he learned about viticulture and winemaking. Nobody is born knowing that. Um, and when he was asked to take over the winemaking at Clan Constantia in 1719, he already knew what to do. So he, I'm guessing that at Claver Fallet, he either had a knecht who could teach him or he took up some kind of an apprenticeship because to be appointed winemaker at a, a brand new little farm, but that already had um, vines that were producing, you have to know something. Um, it's not something you can, you can go into cold. He must have had some knowledge already. I'm particularly fascinated by where did he get that knowledge from. Now, his sister, Johanna Colain, who was two years younger than him, she got after the clue of, in other words, Camps Bay. 
And there she settled herself down and just as industrious as her mother was and her, grand, and the, her grandfather before that, she farmed vegetables. By 1719, when her brother Johannes was appointed at Clan Constantia, she had 7,000 vines at Camps Bay. She also cut and sold firewood, which was illegal um, as part of her servitude. She was supposed to get permission. And just like, as I told you, all the Everts and Colleen women got into trouble with the law, so did she. She also sold lime, which she was also not allowed to do. Whether she sold it from somebody else who made it, I don't know, or whether she burned her own lime, because there is a part of Camps Bay um, where the, the, the paddling pool is now that used to call, be called Limestone Bay. Um, but there was definitely lime burning going on at some point. She even built a road to Cape Town. Obviously not a tar road like we think of as roads today, but a track. Um, and I'm, I think this track went around through Sea Point. It, it's not the one that went over the Kloof. Um, then in 1732, she married Karl Georg Wieser. Now he also was a soldier. And again, I'm guessing because he came from, oh, I forget the place now, but a town in Germany. And he had, he had wine growing experience. And so I'm guessing that he also was the Knecht at the Camps Bay farm. Um, so they got married. And then just to show you briefly what became of Arthur de Kloof, it was in the Colleen family until at least um, 1745, possibly later. And then it was sold um, uh, to the Wernich family. And eventually, well, you probably all know the story of von Kamps and why Camps Bay is named after him. Um, but during the uh, fortification of 1786, von Kamps uh, left the Cape and, um, and then in his absence, you can see here, if you, you can see where the farm is, and can you see those three little lines along the beach, the dark lines, those are trenches. And when he returned, he complained bitterly about the, the fact that the soldiers had dug trenches all over his farm, that they trampled all over his vegetables, um, probably helped themselves to a good lot of the stuff too, and that his road had been destroyed. Of course, it wasn't actually the road he initially built, it was Johanna Colleen, but he took credit for that and maybe he had um, done some of the upkeep on it. Um, he, he demanded restitution, which he was not given, um, and he then sold it to the government, and um, it eventually how it became government property. There you can see those three lines. So when we look at a later map, after the first British occupation, you can see that the farming has become less. There are not as many fields anymore because the government didn't have too many too much um, to do with that. Um, it was used by um, Lord Charles Somerset. It was used by, um, oh, was he the fiscal or the under fiscal Uli fund? Um, many people used it as a holiday, um, I won't say resort, that's not the right word, but it was a good getaway. 1796, so you can see that is, was British. Um, Thomas Bowler painted it in 1850, or roughly 1850. There is the house by then. There were actually several buildings. Um, it's, it's not, this building is probably the one that was um, um, rebuilt for Somerset. He had it completely refurbished and rebuilt and, uh, in his time. But... Um, they probably built every part of the newer structure out of the existing structures that Maria Evert had built. Um, you know, nobody just tears down a 
a building unless there's a particularly good reason, they usually adapt and convert. This house became quite big, um, but there were also art buildings. As you can see over here, this was in 1828 already, you can see there wasn't just one building. Um, and maybe whatever Maria built for her family and that Johanna lived in was just very small. Um, and by 1902, the house was sort of a mishmash of Cape Dutch, a um, little bit of French with the French doors, um, was constantly being adapted. Um, and there you can see the farm in 1931, and you can see the house outlined in red. And to its immediate top right, um, you can see the bowling green. And um, it obviously stood in the way of development, as you can imagine. So today, that's where the house stood. Um, this has subsequently changed even more because this portion of the bowling green has now been given over to the Camps Bay Preparatory School. Um, it's very sad that Camps Bay's oldest property and one of the properties that contained so much history was just knocked flat. Um, right, so that gives us a chance to jump to Plan Constantia instead. Um, in 1716, Simon van der Stel's Constantia property or Constantia farm was sold off. Um, and the reason it was only done in 1716 is that because of the smallpox epidemic, they waited until that was over before they started selling it off. Um, although it had been granted to Simon van der Stel, on his death it reverted to the company. Um, and so it was sold by the, the, by the Dutch East India Company. Um, the portion that became Clan Constantia was a very small vineyard. It was a small part of Simon van der Stel's Constantia. It had already been planted with vineyards and apparently it was, it was good. The vineyard was yielding. Um, it was sold to a young Jürgen Kotzer who was married uh, to Elsa B or Elsia van Hoff, who herself was a daughter of a free slave. And by 1717, um, Jan and Elsa B built the first dwelling on Clan Constantia. Um, I believe, and I don't know for sure though, that the, the building that they built was what is now the wine cellar, which would have been a long house, much like the one at Bergfleet. And in those long houses, everything happened. They had uh, the, the living quarters for the family, the stables for the horses, space for the animals, uh, cellar for the wine, storage for the tools, everything, and a room for the slaves probably too. Um, you know, it was like a one size fits all. Everything happened in one building. And then this, later that same year, he employed Johannes Colain. So by then I would have would think that that wine cellar or that longhouse was, was finished. And now they could get on with the serious business of making wine. But Jan was already an elderly man at the time and he died that same year. And so Elsha inherited Clan Constantia and it was then Johannes Colain's opportunity to not only chill her wine but also to warm her bed like any good man should and the next year they got married um, it was not a long marriage because she died six years later and then Colleen inherited Clan Constantia it's always fortuitous to marry a widow with a farm now the farm next door was originally owned, um, and by farm next door, I mean Groot Constantia, was owned by Simon van der Stel and originally, and then um, Willaf Berg and his wife Anna de Koenen were the next owners. Um, now much has always been said about Anna de Koenen farming it and making brandy and so on. I seriously doubt that. I think they were absent land owners. Um, 
Anna de Quinnen lived quite a good life in the city. She had quite a few buildings and, and houses in town. She, she had a lot of jewelry. She was very neatly turned out, beautiful woman. Um, I think she would have enjoyed the high life of the town more. But she left uh, when, when she was widowed in 1724, the same year that Colleen inherited Groot Constantia, the farm was left um, in the hands of an overseer and some slaves. Um, and it's very likely that Johannes then already, um, you know, having established a relationship probably with um, um, Anna de Koning, that he started using Groot Constantia straight away already to extend his vineyards and to just use the farm because it was, it was just there. Um, he was already making a name for himself by that stage and he was busy producing those famous Constantia wines. And just take note, this is considerably before um, Hendrik Kluti even arrived at Constantia. Johannes had a white Constantia that was a late harvest made of Muscadel and Stian, and he had a red Constantia which was made of Pontac and a bit of Muscadel mixed with Stian. Um, I ran this all past the current winemaker at Groot Constantia, um, and he, he did not know this, but as I mentioned these things, he nodded and he said, ah, and he knew exactly what these were. So Stian, for instance, is Chenin Blanc, and well, I'm not a winemaker, I don't even drink this stuff, so I'm sure many of you know more about this than I do. I just find it immensely interesting. Here is a son of a freed slave, probably, probably uneducated, possibly even illiterate. I mean, there were no schools when Johannes Colain was growing up. And yet he has the skill to make wines that put Constantia on the map. He kept his wine in sulfated barrels. Sulfur, of course, is a, a very good preservative, um, had been for many years. He burnt nutmeg in the barrels for extra flavor. It's also slightly hallucinogenic, so there's extra um, benefit of, to that. And he fortified his wine if he shipped it in barrels. He fortified it with brandy. And we know that the brandy was made at Hurut Constantia. Um, there were brandy stills found. And even if you go today to Hurut Constantia and you walk through the house, you will see there's a splendid brandy still there in the kitchen. Um, but if he shipped the wine in bottles, um, he did not fortify it, especially for local consumption. Bottles in those days were those small little dumpy bottles you may have seen a picture of. They were only 340 milliliters um, capacity, so half of what a bottle of wine today is. So you could snaffle it down much faster. Um, what his ambition was, um, he wasn't satisfied to just produce for the local market. He wanted to access markets beyond the Cape because that way he could make a, make a name for himself. So he offered to provide both Red Constantia and White Constantia the, to the Dutch East India Company at below market price, certain numbers, so that he also still had other amounts to sell privately. Um, and that was, that was accepted. And then of course the Dutch East India Company being a for-profit company, um, they then, they had all the means for marketing and shipping and selling and they shipped that wine for um, Colain to the European markets. And very soon he had more orders than he could produce. And so he then seriously began to farm at what was a fairly neglected Groot Constantia. And um, Bula Gerbe, the winemaker at Groot Constantia, did not know this. He was quite surprised that Johannes Kulain had actually farmed Groot Constantia as well. Um, but it was right next door to his farm, so it made perfect sense. Um, in 1733, the, that wine was so sought after in Europe, and the Dutch East India Company asked for his whole production for that particular year. Now he, he, like his mother, was clever and astute, so he said no, and they didn't ask why. He'd actually had a poor harvest. 
the year before. So he didn't have enough to sell, but they thought that, oh, these wines are getting really um, popular and, and famous, and it's obviously worth more money than we thought of. Then a very interesting thing happened. Um, Karl Georg Wieser. Now, if you remember, he was the one who was married to Johanna Colain, Johannes's sister. He was persuaded to buy Grue Constantia when it came onto the market by Johannes Colain. And um, Johannes arranged the loan for Visa to buy it and put in a lot of money on, the, on the, of his own as well. Um, and he saw, Johannes saw the opportunity there if he worked with his brother-in-law who had knowledge of wine growing. I think the town was Heidelberg where he was from in Germany, um, famous for its wine growing. So now the two, the brother-in-law and the brother-in-laws could work together. Plus Johanna Kulain also had experience of winemaking and growing because she did that already at the after the um, Kluwerf Camps Bay farm. But unfortunately, she died very soon after this. And by 1736, Kulain was able to up his price um, because now not only did he have more, but he could concentrate on doing it better. And so he could, he could dictate his price. And it was accepted by the Dutch East India Company because now he had a little bit of power to wave around. Um, I said earlier that it was very, you know, very logical, I suppose you could say that, that um, he should farm both farms because they were so close together. So he controlled winemaking at both Groot Constantia and Klein Constantia. And the people in Europe who bought the Constantia wine, they did not know from which actual farm the wine came. It didn't matter to them. It was called Constantia wine. And it was only later that the two wine productions split again, more in, um, in Hendrik Kluti's time or even possibly a little bit before. So there's the Groot Constantia homestead, um, as we all know it. And down here in the little valley is Klein Constantia, which is today the Hoop of Constantia. And if you look there, you can see the homestead on the left and you can see that long wine cellar on the right, which I think was the original longhouse. But they're within walking, practically within spitting distance of one another, still are. Um, eventually the Kulains and I, not sure if it was in Johannes Kulain's time or his son's time. His second wife was Johanna Appel, um, who also came with some money. And so when he died, she ran the farm with her second husband until the son, the youngest son, was ready to buy and take over the farm. So Klein Constantia Farm. Um, looked like that in the early days. Here's the, on the right, you can see that old wine cellar, what I think is the longhouse. It hasn't changed much. It still looks very much like that. The house has changed. But if you look at the house, you can see that it's a double story and it's got three gables. And if you remember, or maybe you don't, it doesn't matter, but Groot Constantia um, from Simon van der Stel's day was also double story, but it had two gables. So the Colains, who by now knew that they were, you know, the premier family for making Constantia wine, um, did go a little bit all out in making their house look particularly spocherig, and why not? But a later Colain, um, I don't know now for sure if it was Johannes Colain's son or his grandson, because there were then generations that carried on the whining, wine farming, they changed the house, um, um, possibly because Hendrik Kluti also changed the house from a double story to a single and one gable, and that was the fashion across the Cape. Um, they did that too, and that's still very much what it looks like today. Um, still called the Hoopop Constantia today. So coming to an end now, um, it would be interesting to see, and because I can't really see all of you and your reaction, if I asked you to put up your hand, who knew 
about Johannes Kulain, it probably will not be everybody. So many people don't know about Johannes Kulain and the legacy. Oh, I see a hand there. <laughs> um, so, so he left a legacy that is not actually that well known for various reasons. But let's have a look at what he actually managed to achieve. He took off where Simon van der Stel left. So, um, you know, for, for years, there was no wine farming happening there, especially during the time of the, um, of the smallpox epidemic. Um, he farmed both Klein Constantia and Groot Constantia for a while. He was the first Cape winemaker to export wines to Europe. Um, because he negotiated those shipments with the, with the Dutch East India Company. And he put Constantia wines on the map. And interestingly enough, he also increased the value of Pro Constantia. Now, maybe you can argue, no, he didn't do that single-handedly, market prices and all that. And I accept that. But just have a look at this. So when Visa that was Johannes Kulain's brother-in-law bought Groot Constantia in 1735. He paid 20,800 holders for it. When van der Spey, who was Visser's stepson, I think, bought it after Visser died, he paid 45,000 holders for it. Now that's, that's more than double. And that's astonishing. And that was then, that period was when Johannes Kulain was alive. Johannes Kulain died in 1743. And, and as I said, his wife took over the, the managing of the farm with her, her, her second husband until the son was old enough to take on. Um, Sereria bought it in 78, he paid 53,000 kilders. And at that point, then it was sold to Hendrik Kluti, who paid 60,000 holders. So in something like 40 years, the value of that farm increased threefold. Now, my question is, why was Hendrik Kluti even interested in Groot Constantia? Would he have been interested in Groot Constantia if it were not for Johannes Kulain putting their wines on the map? And I think he might not have been if Hendrik Kluti hadn't bought Kurt Constantia, and he definitely did turn it into a powerhouse of wine production. I don't know. But I think, again, that um, we owe Johannes Kulain a, a debt of gratitude for, for, for what he did. Um, Kluti, when he started farming at Kurt Constantia, he expanded on the techniques developed by Kulain um, because Kluti had been farming in Stellenbosch where the land is a little bit different, that the climate is a little bit different, it's hotter um, and so on and so forth. So the winemaking would have been slightly different. So then we come to the more recent past. So in June 23, 2003, the Cape Town International Convention Center was open and Thabo Mbeki opened it and gave a speech, a sort of a politically correct speech. And I, I put it into quotation marks, but I've already fiddled a bit with it because I wasn't completely satisfied with the quality of the language, the English that went into it. But be that as it may, what's interesting is he gave credit to Maria Evertz as a slave born woman, to the fact that she was a farmer, that she planted things and tilled the soil and kept cattle and sheep, that she owned what became Camps Bay. And he gave credit to her son, Johannes Kulain, who was the first of a family of Kulains that farmed side by side um, with the other farmers in the Constantia Valley. This is a, um, a Google Earth shot of the Hoop. There's the de Hoop house. In the background, you can see Groot Constantia. Um, what's not so evident is those vineyards behind or to your left of the homestead. Um, that's not flat land. It's actually quite hilly there. It's a, a steep hill. Um, and can you see that? in the middle of the vineyards. That is where all the Kulains lie, because that's the graveyard. 
The only thing above the ground today is this particular tomb, which is what you can see from the earth there in the middle of the vineyards. And it's not even quite sure who actually reposes um, in that tomb. It is believed to be his grandson and Leonora Cullain, the lady after whom Lady Smile is ostensibly named, but even that is not sure. Um, but there must have been many, many more. I know that Johanna Cullain, Johannes's sister, and the baby that died with her when she died were buried there. But there's no stone, there's nothing. Um, and Tim Hart, who was the um, archaeologist that restored this tomb, um, said he had the feeling there were more graves in the area, but um, you know the, their brief was not to unearth those. I, I, I'm quite sure that, that um, Johannes Kulain would have been buried there. Um, the soil, I'm told by, by Bula at Hrod Constantia and De Hoop of Constantia is quite acidic um, because of the granite um, that, is, that makes up the soil. And so that would have meant that many of the bones would have disintegrated. And it then just reminds us that we are all dust to dust and, and ashes to ashes. And I never want to believe that because I always want to believe that inside these tombs are these nicely preserved bones and skeletons that we can find more history about, but it doesn't work like that in real life. So there they lie, the Kulains, um, back into the earth that they told. And then in just to sum up from the title of, of my talk, um, you know, where does Swata Maria fit in with the, the history and the, the remembrance that maybe we'd like to keep of her is, is just to look at the whole thing that although she was born into slavery, she really turned her fortunes around and she had very little advantages. The only real advantage she had was that her father had land and, and that she was bought free by him and, and she she could then build on, um, on her own wealth through that little market garden. And she became a formidable farmer, considering that this was the 17th and 18th century. And um, she was a woman, she was a black woman. Um, and she managed a hell of a lot. She must have had an enormous amount of energy and enterprise and stability and um, um, yeah, just chutzpah, I suppose. And when she died, she was one of the richest landowners at the Cape. And that is actually quite astonishing. And of course, she's the progenitor of the Kulain family in South Africa. Um, it would be quite interesting at some point to know where they all are and, and you know, what their um, take on the matter is. And float, float, my story is eight. Je praat met de directe afstammeling van Zwarte uh, Maria Evert. Uh, Zij was mijn zuster um, oma. En uh, mijn familie kwam door die Kulijns. Want om een lang story kort te maken, een van haar um, afstammelingen is op die oude einde getrouwd met de Jeger. En zij uh, dochter is, is toen nou getrouwd met mijn uh, stamvader, wat in die land aangekomen het in 1762. En ik uh, heb die, die story ontzettend interessant uh, gevind. Um, omdat ik geweet het, uh, Maria was uh, uh, een van mij directe lijn voorzaten. Dus ik wil niet zeggen bye, dankie. Um, die, die, iemand die zo wat het ontzettend bij geniet het. Waar komt die story van Grieki? Oh ja. Wat met, uh, was, was, zij was ook een familielid van Maria Evers, niet waar? Ja, wat die Exteen. Ja, wat met die Exteen uh, een verhouding gehad het en toen hij beschuldigd is dat zij hom wil vermoorden. Ja. Zij, um, 
die ekstien was um, een buiten echtelijke kind van Bastian Colijnse dochter Agnitsi. Um, maar nie, zover so ik kon uitwerk, nie Swarte Maria's dochter nie. Ek sien, oh ja. Maar, maar Bastian Colijn het een verhouding met haar pa gehad voordat hij een verhouding met um, Maria Ewits begin het. Um, ek weet van die story, maar ik heb dit nog niet um, so degelijk gevolg nie, maar dit is ook weer een interessante story wat uit ons verlede kom. Um, daar is, da is al iets geskryf, ek, ek kon het maar net nog niet opgespoor het online nie. Um, ek, ek was een beetje skrikkerig nou die afgelopen paar maanden om in die archief of die deeds office te gaan snuffel uh, met die COVID en so voorts, maar een of ander tijd moet ik mezelf maar op mijn voeten krijgen om dit te doen. Maar dat is ook een baie interessante story. Dankie. I came in a bit late. So, uh, you mentioned Clava Fale. Where yes. about is that? That's the one at the West Coast or the one in Simonstown? Uh, Darling. Darling, okay, up that side, right? Because right I'm busy it's researching right a post. Right, okay. I'm busy researching a family from Simonstown at the moment, and they the Breda felt uh, felt family who were in Clava Fale, which is Clava Valley in the top of Yes. The mountains in Simonstown. So I was just wondering if it was the same one. No, sorry not. But nice to see you, Derek. Thanks. So Ziggy, what are you going to do next? <laughs> you know, I'm a real You're magpie. Making... <laughs> I'm a magpie and I just pick up on things that interest me. I'm not quite done with the story yet. I um, it It touches me on so many different levels. Um, I'm currently looking at, you know, I'm trying to find out whether um, Johannes Colain could read and write, which means I'd have to go and find some documents that have either got his signature or his cross on it. Um, I know that Bastian Colain um, signed the Corte de Dutzi that um, Willem Adrian van der Stel sort of coerced people to sign. Which is interesting but not surprising considering it was Willem Adrian van der Stel that gave them the farm camps bay. Um, Swarte Maria, there's a big problem because um, Evert van Guinea's estate papers have not survived. And that would have been the key to so much. Because he had a farm at Stellenbosch, which of course Swarte Maria inherited too. So she was farming like most of the, the Table Valley patrician types, they were also, once Stellenbosch opened as the second colony, they were all having farms as well at Stellenbosch. So Angela from Bengal, all the same, she had a farm at Drakenstein. So this was the, the popular thing to do. And so a lot of the money was coming from their farm at Stellenbosch, at Valgelegen, which was the farm at Bortleray. So that's a very important aspect that you need to, to consider uh, in terms of her accumulation of wealth. Then there's also aspects like the fact that in her will, not all her children are mentioned. And so Achniti Kulain was in fact her daughter. I'm absolutely sure of that. And of course she was fathered by, um, I mean, she was fathered by, um, she took on Kulain's name, but she, she's baptized as a slave. And we've got a baptism. And of course there's a connection because Swart Maria was friends with, uh, with, uh, with the Murasi um, Stammudder of the, um, oh, I can't even think of these names now. Sorry, it's late. It's, um, I'm, I'm in Tokyo, so this is very late uh, for me. We're seven hours ahead of you guys. But anyway, so um, there's just that aspect that I wanted to mention. Um, uh, and, and one other thing is that Tendama was, of course, the surgeon um, and very influential. Uh, and for him to father a child by Swarte Maria, that should really, you know, make one wonder what was really going on. Um, Tendama's wife, Lena de Schoot, was purportedly a lover of Willem Adrian van der Stel. This is all <laughs> gossip, but, but it get, the plot thickens, that's all I'm saying. There were connections and interconnections. There were things going down there that are really, really need to be interrogated to use the new academic jargon 
but certainly um, there's lots out there that we still don't know about. And then just another thing, um, I'm, I was very surprised to hear that Johanna Kulain was farming at Camps Bay. Because I have, I have it differently, and that is Irvet, the youngest son, he, the farm was confiscated from him because he neglected it altogether. And that's how it fell out of the, 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 the ownership of the family. And poor Evert, the youngest, of course, he went, he went the opposite of Johannes. He regressed as in seriously badly. He was a dairyman and um, his children were taken away from him because he had totally neglected them. They were growing up um, in, in filth and squalor and the authorities stepped in. So that's another side to the whole Kalein story. It's not all success and, and big money. Um, but Camps Bay was certainly his when it was confiscated. And then it was even given the intriguing name of um, Altuna, which I cannot explain. And it's possibly an error, but I don't. Looking at it again uh, and again, I'm thinking not. But for some reason, it was renamed. And, and when it was confiscated from him in the actual um, resolution by the Council of Policy, the name Altuna is, is actually noted. So anyway, that's just the aspect about her children. There's, and she had another daughter if, um, um, who owned most of Salt River and who was also very wealthy. So, you know, um, these people are not mentioned in her will, which of course raises another question. Um, in terms of, of inheritance law, um, children are all entitled to inherit, but there's also testamentary intervention. So she might have actually left them out for whatever reason. Achniti was controversial because of course she had a relationship with Extian and he was probably one of the rich, richest tree burgers at the time. And there's another story there because he's got lots of things going down. Yeah, one more thing. Sorry, I really should stop now. Um, the Vissas, of course, and, and, and the, the connection to the Johanna, of course, was, the, and, and Johanna's marrying the, the widow of um, Van, Van Hof. So there are very interesting connections. Um, Maria Van, <laughs> I don't even know where to start because this is, this, this is too much information. The, um, she was, they were, I, I don't think Johanna was farming at Camps Bay. I think she was farming closer to Constantia. And, and then they joined forces and that's how the, the, the wine producing improved. But the connection there is the other slave woman is of course, she was the oldest and this is crucial. She was the oldest um, half slag slave born at the Cape. She literally had her own special status and her name was Maria Hendricks. And of course, Simon van Estel even died in her home, which most people don't know. And this is so intriguing because once again, a lot of the, the, the wine knowledge was coming from that side, not just from the Culeins. So it was, a, it was a joint effort, that's my point. But if I may just respond to one or two of your points, I have read that um, because Evert's farming expeditions in Stellenbosch didn't go well, he sold Velgelegen before his death. Oh. So in that case, then mm. um, it couldn't have been passed on to Swata Maria. Um, uh, then Anna and Agnizzi, there seems to be a confusion between the two, and I don't know what the answer is. But there is also in the records in, in first 50 years that Maria Evertz had a child at the age of 13 called Anna, not Agnizzi. But, but Anna and Agnizzi get confused all the time right through the history. And as I said, I don't know what the answer to that is. Anna was not mentioned at all in the, in the will. Either she had died by then, if she even existed. I doubt her existence for various reasons, but at any rate, that, that's another point. So that whole Anna Agnizzi um, issue, there's still lots of work that can be done to clear that up. I know about Evert farming at Camps Bay. Um, I was under the impression that he probably took over from Johanna when she left to go to Groot Constantia. And he was married into the Van Dierwinter family. And I think that at some point she owned the farm. And I don't know 
if that meant that she put up the money for it initially or whether she, when it was taken away from him, that it was given to her. Um, but when she died, there were quite a lot of children and that maybe that's when he neglected the children. So that to me is also still a, a little bit of a, a hazy business. Um, and I was interested to hear what you said about the daughter who owned most of Salt River. I'm not quite sure who that would be. She was Cornelia Crock, was her name. Oh, Cornelia Everina, yes. Yes, and the Everina, of course, is a, a you know, harks back to Evert, the name. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. yes, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah, that's okay. her eldest daughter. Uh, well, Anna was the oldest, the one that died young. And then, yes. of course, um, she's the oldest. And then Achniti is this, the third daughter. And Achniti, then Anna comes in as when she gets married, there's an error in the in the marriage record, but it's actually her, Achniti. Mm, okay. And well, you know, she, she she we have her on record, we have her children, we, you know, there's and clearly they are connected to, to Swata Swata Maria. Are you talking as, about Cornelia now? Cornelia and Achniti. They were certainly both her daughters. And the problem is they don't they are not mentioned in the estate papers, and that's why most people think they're not her, her, her own progeny, her own offspring. Agnizzi, yeah, um, she did mention Cornelia in, in, in the will, though, that she was supposed okay. to look after Bastian Colain and, you know, feed him and clothe him, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but often um, the girls are not mentioned if they were already married by then or it was expected that they would marry and then be looked after by their Well, no, no, in, in Dutch law of inheritance, the daughters were was entitled to inherit the same as the as the sons. And, and if they were married, then their husbands would then be named. So, no, this, I think they were definitely not willed by the mother. They were left out of the will. She exercised her testamentary discretion. Okay. But I'm, I'm still interested in the, how the daughter got to Salt River and what she owned there. Is, is there any place you can point me to? Oh, I have to look at my, 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 my data, but sure, I can, you know. Um, let me just see if I can quickly hear. She was married to Peter Christian Behrens from Hamburg. He remarried Hermina Herwig, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people. Um, he, I think, um, yeah, I think the husband was the gold digger, you know, sitting when he married Cornelia Everina Clark. And of course, we don't know who this Clark man was. You know, I'm still looking for no. him. So who was Swart Maria? What man was she having this child by? And then, um, okay, um, there's a joint will, um, 1725. I haven't got details here that are what I'm looking at for the. Um, no, don't don't, don't worry. It was valued at 16,000 guilders. Okay. All right. But, but basically, the core of what is now uh, Salt River. Uh, which I think eventually falls into the ownership of the Lopesha Stomfather, I think was their property. And I might go, and, or, um, and I'm guessing further because, you know, this, this is something that needs to be looked at. The old, the, you know, the, the, the pacht for the, for the alcohol was always Salt River and Drikopen. And I suspect they, you know, the, the cluster mm -hmm. of housing at the, at the inn was where they were living and owning and operating. And that's where their money was coming from too. The Bredefelds of Claverflay at Simonstown are connected to my great, 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 great grandfather, who was a bastard Hottentot at Blombosfontein, next to Claverflay in the, uh, at Grotepost, because my Lang family were all working for the Ducats at Grotepost. My great great grandmother's brother was actually born on that farm. So the Bredefelds married into the Jakobs family, and some of them ended up very strangely at Simonstown. And at the back of the mountains at Claverflay and Simonstown, the Barset Hottentot Moses, who's the founding father of the Bredefelds, they were, they were operating there. So there's a very interesting connection between Simonstown and, and uh, Achterbloberg, that area. And I suspect that they were shipping from Saldana Bay to Simonstown and that there was a thing going there. And that's never been looked at before. So if you want to know more about the Bredefelds, um, I've got some information too. And I'm also looking at the Samstown connection 